Section 14 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Ulbrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 14. Appendices. Part 1. Appendix 1. Right and Wrong. Readers who are using my elements of drawing may be surprised by my saying here that Tintoret may lead them wrong, while in the elements he is one of the six men named as being always right. I bring the apparent inconsistency forward at the beginning of this appendix because the illustration of it will be farther useful in showing the real nature of the self-contradiction which is often alleged against me by careless readers. It is not only possible, but a frequent condition of human action, to do right and be right yet so as to mislead other people if they rashly imitate the thing done. For there are many rights which are not absolutely, but relatively right, right only for that person to do under those circumstances, not for this person to do under other circumstances. Thus it stands between Titian and Tintoret. Titian is always absolutely right. You may imitate him with entire security that you are doing the best thing that can possibly be done for the purpose in hand. Tintoret is always relatively right, relatively to his own aims and peculiar powers. But you must quite understand Tintoret before you can be sure what his aim was and why he was then right in doing what would not be right always. If, however, you take the pains thus to understand him, he becomes entirely instructive and exemplary, just as Titian is, and therefore I have placed him among those who are always right, and you can only study him rightly with that reference for him. Then the artists who are named as admitting question of right and wrong are those who, for some mischance of circumstance or shortcoming in their education, do not always do right, even with relation to their own aims and powers. Take, for example, the quality of imperfection in drawing form. There are many pictures of Tintoret in which the trees are drawn with a few curved flourishes of the brush instead of leaves. This is absolutely wrong. If you copied the tree as a model, you would be going very wrong indeed. But it is relatively, and for Tintoret's purposes, right. In the nature of the superficial work, you will find there must have been a cause for it. Somebody perhaps wanted the picture in a hurry to fill a dark corner. Tintoret, good-naturedly, did all he could, painted the figures tolerably, had five minutes left only for the trees, when the servants came. Let him wait another five minutes, and this is the best foliage we can do in the time. Entirely, admirably, unsurpassably right under the conditions. Titian would not have worked under them, but Tintoret was kinder and humbler, yet he may lead you wrong if you don't understand him. Or perhaps another day, somebody came in while Tintoret was at work, who tormented Tintoret, an ignoble person. Titian would have been polite to him and gone on steadily with his trees. Tintoret cannot stand the ignobleness. It is unendurably repulsive and discomforting to him. The black plague take him, and the trees too. Shall such a fellow see me paint? And the trees go all to pieces. This, in you, would be mere ill-breeding and ill-temper. In Tintoret, it was one of the necessary conditions of his intense sensibility. Had he been capable, then, of keeping his temper, he could never have done his greatest works. Let the trees go to pieces by all means. It is quite right that they should. He is always right. But in a background of Gainsborough, you would find the trees unjustifiably gone to pieces. The carelessness of form there is definitely purposed by him, adopted as an advisable thing, and therefore it is both absolutely and relatively wrong. It indicates his being imperfectly educated as a painter, and not having brought out all his powers. It may still happen that the man whose work thus partially erroneous is greater far than others who have fewer faults. Gainsborough's and Reynolds' wrongs are more charming than almost anybody else's right still they occasionally are wrong but the venetians and velasquez never footnote at least after his style was formed early pictures like the adoration of the magi in our gallery are of little value End footnote. 
I ought, perhaps, to have added in that Manchester address, only one does not like to say things that shock people, some words of warning against painters likely to mislead the student. For, indeed, though here and there something may be gained by looking at inferior men, there is always more to be gained by looking at the best, and there is not time with all the looking of human life to exhaust even one great painter's instruction. How, then, shall we dare to waste our sight and thoughts on inferior ones, even if we could do so, which we rarely can, without danger of being led astray? Nay, strictly speaking, what people call inferior painters are in general no painters. Artists are divided by an impassable gulf into the men who can paint and who cannot. The men who can paint often fall short of what they should have done, are repressed, or defeated, or otherwise rendered inferior one to another. Still, there is an everlasting barrier between them and the men who cannot paint, who can only, in various popular ways, pretend to paint. And if once you know the difference, there is always some good to be got by looking at a real painter, seldom anything but mischief to be got out of a false one. But do not suppose real painters are common. I do not speak of living men, but among those who labor no more in this England of ours, since it first had a school, we have had only five real painters, Reynolds, Gainsborough, Hogarth, Richard Wilson, and Turner. The reader may, perhaps, think I have forgotten Wilkie. No, I once much overrated him as an expressional draughtsman, not having then studied the figure long enough to be able to detect superficial sentiment. But his colour I have never praised. It is entirely false and valueless, and it would be unjust to English art if I did not here express my regret that the admiration of Constable, already harmful enough in England, is extending even into France. There was, perhaps, the making in Constable of a second or third-rate painter, if any careful discipline had developed in him the instincts which, though unparalleled for narrowness, were, as far as they went, true. But as it is, he is nothing more than an industrious and innocent amateur blundering his way to a superficial expression of one or two popular aspects of common nature. And my readers may depend upon it, that all blame which I express in this sweeping way is trustworthy. I have often had to repent of over-praise of inferior men, and continually to repent of insufficient praise of great men. But of broad condemnation, never. For I do not speak it but after the most searching examination of the matter, and under stern sense of need for it, so that whenever the reader is entirely shocked by what I say, he may be assured, every word is true. Footnote. He must, however, be careful to distinguish blame, however strongly expressed of some special fault or error in a true painter, from these general statements of inferiority or worthlessness. Thus he will find me continually laughing at Wilson's tree painting, not because Wilson could not paint, but because he had never looked at a tree. End footnote. It is just because it so much offends him that it was necessary, and knowing that it must offend him, I should not have ventured to say it without certainty of its truth. I say certainty, for it is just as possible to be certain whether the drawing of a tree or a stone is true or false, as whether the drawing of a triangle is. And what I mean primarily by saying that a picture is in all respects worthless, is that it is in all respects false which is not a matter of opinion at all, but a matter of ascertainable fact, such as I never assert till I have ascertained. And the thing so commonly said about my writings, that they are rather persuasive than just, and that though my language may be good, I am an unsafe guide in art criticism, is, like many other popular estimates in such matters, not merely untrue, but precisely the reverse of the truth. It is truth, like reflections in water, distorted much by the shaking, receptive surface, and in every particular upside down. For my language, until within the last six or seven years, was loose, obscure, and more or less feeble, and still, though I have tried hard to mend it, the best I can do is inferior to much contemporary work. 
no description that I have ever given of anything is worth four lines of Tennyson, and in serious thought my half-pages are generally only worth about as much as a single sentence either of his or of Carlyle's. They are, I well trust, as true and necessary, but they are neither so concentrated nor so well put. But I am an entirely safe guide in art judgment, and that, simply as the necessary result of my having given the labor of my life to the determination of facts, rather than to the following of feelings or theories. Not, indeed, that my work is free from mistakes. It admits many, and always must admit many, from its scattered range. But in the long run it will be found to enter sternly and searchingly into the nature of what it deals with, and the kind of mistake it admits is never dangerous, consisting usually in pressing the truth too far. It is quite easy, for instance, to take an accidental irregularity in a piece of architecture, which less careful examination would never have detected at all, for an intentional irregularity, quite possible to misinterpret an obscure passage in a picture, which a less earnest observer would never have tried to interpret. But mistakes of this kind, honest, enthusiastic mistakes, are never harmful, because they are always made in a true direction falls forward on the road, not into the ditch beside it, and they are sure to be corrected by the next comer. But the blunt and dead mistakes made by too many other writers on art, the mistakes of sheer inattention and want of sympathy, are mortal. The entire purpose of a great thinker may be difficult to fathom, and we may be over and over again more or less mistaken in guessing at his meaning. But the real, profound, nay, quite bottomless and unredeemable mistake, is the fool's thought, that he had no meaning. I do not refer, in saying this, to any of my statements respecting subjects which it has been my main work to study. As far as I am aware, I have never yet misinterpreted any picture of Turner's, though often remaining blind to the half of what he had intended neither have i as yet found anything to correct in my statements respecting venetian architecture footnote the subtle portions of the byzantine palaces given in precise measurements in the second volume of the stones of venice were alleged by architects to be accidental irregularities they will be found by every one who will take the pains to examine them most assuredly and indisputably intentional and not only so but one of the principal subjects of the designer's care Footnote. But in casual references to what has been quickly seen, it is impossible to guard wholly against error, without losing much valuable observation, true in ninety-nine cases out of a hundred, and harmless even when erroneous. Appendix 2. Reynolds' Disappointment. It is very fortunate that in the fragment of Mason's manuscript, published lately by Mr. Cotton in his Sir Joshua Reynolds' notes, footnote, Smith, Soho Square, 1859, and footnote. Record is preserved of Sir Joshua's feelings respecting the paintings in the window of New College, which might otherwise have been supposed to give his full sanction to this mode of painting on glass. Nothing can possibly be more curious to my mind than the great painter's expectations, or his having at all entertained the idea that the qualities of colour which are peculiar to opaque bodies could be obtained in a transparent medium. But so it is, and with the simplicity and humbleness of an entirely great man, he hopes that Mr. Gervas on glass is to excel Sir Joshua on canvas. Happily, Mason tells us the result. With the copy Gervas made of this picture he was grievously disappointed. I had frequently, he said to me, pleased myself by reflecting, after I had produced what I thought a brilliant effect of light and shadow on my canvas, how greatly that effect would be heightened by the transparency which the painting on glass would be sure to produce. It turned out quite the reverse. Appendix 3. Classical Architecture. This passage in the lecture was illustrated by an enlargement of the woodcut, figure 1, but I did not choose to disfigure the middle of this book with it. It is copied from the forty-ninth plate of the third edition of the Encyclopaedia Britannica, Edinburgh, 1797, and represents an English farmhouse arranged on classical principles. 
if the reader cares to consult the work itself he will find in the same plate another composition of similar propriety and dignified by the addition of a pediment beneath the shadow of which quote, a private gentleman who has a small family may find conveniency end, quote. end of section fourteen recording by todd albrick